All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from beautiful blue sky San Diego as usual. And today I'm joined by Brian Levinson, who is over in Bethesda, Maryland. How are you doing? John, I, it's not blue skied. It's a little overcast, but uh, we'll take it. This is actually, I know you, you lived in Virginia for a little yeah. bit. This is a time of year that's pretty nice to be here. My wife and I were talking about maybe moving to San Diego this winter. So um, when winter comes, as, as everybody in the Northeast is saying, winter is coming. And we're all terrified about <laughs> being in pandemic. And during winter, most of the time, we're just like, oh, winter is coming. Now it's like, maybe we need to move for winter. So I might be uh, coming and bunking up next to you if you'll have me. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, to be honest, I will be, I will be honest with you. I mean, we have done Thanksgiving days on the beach, which when, <laughs> when we decided that we wanted a break from like cooking and stuff at home, we just put a whole picnic together and go to the beach for the day, which clearly you couldn't do. And Sounds East terrible. <laughs> Sounds yeah, terrible. All right. Well, Brian is the author of the new book, Shift Your Mind, Nine Mental Shifts to Thrive in Preparation and Performance. And that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, and uh, so let's talk first. I mean, you open with the essential shift between preparation and performance. What, what do you mean by that? So my background is I work as a mental performance coach where I've gotten to work with all kinds of athletes and sports teams mm -hmm. and been really fortunate over the years. And I work as an executive coach where I get to work with all kinds of leaders and people in nonprofit, for-profit, government, all kinds of different places and spaces. The theme of the book is essentially that your mindset for preparation is different than your mindset for performance. And I worked in sales for my first three years out of college. So I know at least a little bit about what your listeners do on a day-to-day -day basis. And my job at one point was to go to restaurants, grocery stores, country clubs, hotels, and try to sell them ice cream and candy. And oftentimes, I had to be prepared because we didn't have the internet in the same way that we have it today. So I had to, you know, print out all of the restaurants or stops I would make along my way. I had to do some research on, you know, what the restaurant or the hotel was about. Um, but once I got in the door, um, I really had to execute. And so when I was in sales and same thing when I work with athletes, the preparation is really about the action or process of making ourselves ready and competent. It's about learning, growing, improving, getting better, getting yourself ready. Performance is about execution. It's about the actions and they're going to be evaluated in some way. If a chef kicked me out of his restaurant or her restaurant, then I was kicked out and I wasn't getting a sale. Um, and my boss was counting how many, um, you know, clients I would get every week and every day. And, um, you know, performance is about execution and there's an evaluation and there's a judgment of some, some matter. So the book is essentially about these shifts that you need to make for your mindset for preparation and your mindset for performance. And I'm happy to go into those as well. Yeah, Cause one thing that I do see with, the, and, and, and it, I think it's become more prevalent than ever, to be honest, because of the, the, the shortcut culture that we live in today. But I do notice that preparation, it, it has been pushed to the side in many ways. And people, as you say, people want to get in right into execution, right into performance. And there isn't, there isn't, I mean, I see it in sales all the time. You'll see salespeople's calendars full of appointments, but what you won't see on it is time blocked out for proper preparation, call planning, all of that kind of stuff. So what, what is it that, why do you think we have moved away from proper preparation and how can you help people understand that that is so critical? I mean, particularly as you've wor worked with high performing athletes, I mean, a high performing athlete would never just turn up on game day or race day, not having trained for the last week or two. I'd actually be curious to get your opinion. Why, why do you think that, why do you think maybe the salespeople that you're around are spending less time preparing than they are performing? Um, well, number one, I think, I mean, I think a, a part of it is, is the fault of sales management because, you know, the people will do, you know, what, what gets measured gets managed. So, I mean, if the sales manager is, is looking at your call sheets, looking at your preparation and then maybe doing after calls, you know, do going on calls with you and then afterwards going, okay, let's look back at your plan and see how that unfolded, how your preparation was. I think that's a large part of it. And I also think that a large part of it too is that everybody you'll talk to will tell you I'm busier than I've ever been in my life. And my answer to that always is, 
are you or are you just more distracted than you've ever been in your life so i think we've allowed ourselves to become extremely dis distracted and we've equated that with being busy therefore we don't have the time when that is nonsense yeah busyness is not productivity and i think we make that distinction all the time and it's really an important distinction so from my perspective preparation let's just use it in, sa in sales terms is you know, learning everything you can about your client, coming up with, all right, what are the potential paths that I can go down with this person? Really everything up until you make an offer. And you think about a negotiation, a negotiation about preparation, then it's about probing, right? Asking great questions. Mm -hmm. And then you propose. And for me, the preparation and the probing is, is they go hand in hand. And so I would call that your preparation mind. And only when you are proposing is when you're actually now executing in that performance mind. And so, you know, if you look at a calendar, I understand what you're saying is that the tendency is that the more that I get in front of people, the more I'm talking to people, the more good things will happen. And I did telemarketing at one point. So I got, you know, bang out however many calls a day and then you find someone and they buy some stuff from you. But I, I think we're, we're often preparing and preparing could be reading a book. Preparing could be mm -hmm. listening to a podcast like this. It could be uh, watching a Ted talk. And I think the issue is if you're just always in that performance mode, you're never reflecting, you're never going into a humble space where you can learn and you can grow and you might be on a hamster wheel that can cause you to be pretty good or even good, but to be great, you have to be humble. You have to work on your craft. You have to think about what's your vision and what do you want to accomplish? Think about the future. You have to be a little perfectionistic on how you approach things. You have to analyze. You have to experiment. You have to be uncomfortable. So these are things that I talk about in the book, in the preparation mind, so that you can shift into the performance mind, which is very different. So humble in preparation, arrogant in performance, work in preparation, play in performance, future thinking in preparation, present in performance, perfectionistic in preparation, adaptable in performance. So to me, we say, oh, you got to be adaptable. Well, if you're always just adjusting and you don't perfect your craft, then you're not standing on any ground or any basis. We say be present. Okay. Yes, we want to be present when we're with our clients. But if you're not doing the work and thinking about what's the purpose of me being here and what can I actually offer my client in the future, then being present is not going to do you a whole lot of good. So um, I really think that both of these are needed. And too often we silo things and say, you just need to be one way. And I think we just need to be more than one thing and we can hold two things at once. So that's essentially what the book is about. And the book is, it's not just something that comes, you know, out of nowhere. It comes from a decade of work with all kinds of elite performers in, in and out of sports. Yeah. And I love that idea about being humble enough to invest in your own learning and to realize that you're, because uh, here's another thing that I always find interesting is when people sit back and maybe they're in a company and they sit back and they wait for that, you know, they're saying, they don't train me, they don't invest in me. And I, and I would say, again, say to people, well, they should, but guess what? The only person who really cares about you and your career is you. And therefore, if you want to get on, invest in yourself. And I think that and I think it, uh, as people get more experience in a job, sometimes the humility goes out of it and they think they know everything. I mean, and it's a natural thing. But I've been doing this forever. I know everything there is to know. In, instead of continually uh, investigating and being curious and investing in yourself. Yeah, there's not an elite performer in the world that doesn't leverage curiosity to continue to grow and develop and get better. You may see them as arrogant because when they're in their arena and they're competing, whether it's an actor or a musician or an athlete or a surgeon or a lawyer or a salesperson or a CEO, whoever it might be. Yeah, okay, you might only see them when they are actually executing. But if you go underneath the hood, you will see that they have spent tons of time trying to learn and grow. And I loved what you said. We live in a world now, there's never been as much information available to the world as, as there is today. I mean, you can go on and educate yourself on a TED Talk or a podcast or read a book. Uh, the access to information is one of the beautiful things of the internet. We can all talk about challenges that come with that. But the reality is you can learn in so many ways. And I think lifelong learning is just a Essential to elite performance and and you have to be humble enough to to be open to growing and taking feedback from people you know from people you don't know uh and just be open to possibilities and, and i think that's a big piece of the puzzle yeah and then i like because i like that combination you have like humble and learn in in preparation and an arrogant in performance because that's the other thing is sometimes i i see 
you know, too much self-doubt and an almost apologetic approach. Like somebody will call me up to sell me something and, and you can tell they're like, oh, you know, you can almost hear them going, I know he's going to say no, or he's going to hang up the phone on me or whatever. I want somebody, as you say, who, who interacts with me, I want to see them confident. I want to know that they have a level of confidence about them or even arrogance that they know something of value that they could share with me. It's like, even if I have somebody come to my home to, you know, propose some, uh, building project here or whatever i want them to i want to kind of feel wow this guy really knows his stuff this guy's on top of it that that's the feeling i want i don't want I, i'm never going to trust somebody i feel is reticent and arrogance is one of the shifts that people really focus on and we're taught that arrogance is bad and we've all probably worked with an arrogant coworker or boss and it's terrible Arrogance in a vacuum is bad. When arrogance is paired with humble preparation, it's really what can unlock your potential. So what do I define arrogance as? It's an exaggerated sense of self or revealing one's own importance or their abilities. And when you are actually executing, when, as I say, you're in the arena, that's when the people that you're working with need to know that you're capable, that you believe in yourself. And, and that's not the time to, to self-doubt. Now, for a salesperson, there is a time where you might say, I don't know, and let me go find out the answer yeah. for you. But that's not, that's not a lack of arrogance. If you have an exaggerated sense of yourself, then you, then you have that ability and capacity to say, hey, I'm going to figure this out. And mm -hmm. your, your identity is not going to get shaped by a lack of result or a lack of outcome. It's this belief that I'm the right person for the job and it's unshakable. I am the right person for the job. And part of me being the right person for the job may be me saying, yeah, I don't know. Let me go find out. So when I say arrogance, I want to be clear on what I mean by that. I don't mean that you're a jerk. I don't mean you treat people poorly. Um, we've seen that side of arrogance and that is not what I'm advocating for. I'm just saying that an un, un an exaggerated self, an unshakable belief that you're the right person for the job and you're going to find a way to make it work. Yeah. And to be honest, I mean, you have to be confident uh, in many ways to say that, to say, well, I don't know about that. I'll go and find that out for you. Because oftentimes when somebody's pre uh, presented with a question that they don't know the answer to, they almost feel the need to make up an answer, which is worse because that often is very transparent or you give misinformation and that's never a good thing. So it's always good. I always li I like, I like experts. I always re recall this from um, a top, top uh, acupuncturist, right? One of the leading guys in the field. Um, and many years ago, my brother was going to him and he'd been going to him for a lot. And then one day he put in a needle and it was really painful. Right. And my brother was like, oh, that was really painful. And he goes, oh, yeah, I can see that. And again, and my brother said, well, what happened? And he goes, I don't know. <laughs> and he, goes, he goes, I really, I could, I could lie, but I have no idea why that, uh, what that happened there. And he, then they just moved on. But the thing is, because he was like this top expert and you go, okay, we just know he's been honest about it. And, and there's, there's a certain like uh, even greater kind of validation that this is a trustworthy person takes confidence to also be humble in preparation. Mm -hmm. Like if you're confident in yourself, then you say, I don't know, let me go learn. Let me go grow. Let me, that, that actually takes confidence. And too often we, we think that you can't be confident and humble. I, I think it takes confidence to be humble and it takes mm -hmm. confidence to step into arrogance. And, and what I, and what I mean by that is to make yourself vulnerable, to put yourself out there. It's way easier to just be like, to have self-doubt and to never actually put yourself out there and go for it. It's way easier to play it safe. I'm just going to work hard, work hard, and then I'm never actually going to try. I'm never going to do the thing. I'm never going to execute. And I find way more people that stay in that preparation mind and aren't able to shift into the performance mm -hmm. mind than the other way around. Now, for the salespeople that are listening to this, you talked about how they are constantly performing. For them, they may need to focus more on that preparation mind. But I will tell you, the people that I work with, they prepare uh, like like they prepare 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 and for them what gets in the way is the lack of capacity to step into that execution mode in performance and and so I just encourage people to think a lot about do I over index on the preparation mind do I over index on the performance mind and in sports they have something called practice where they spend two hours a day at least 
thinking about their preparation and, and thinking about how they can improve, learn, grow. And part of that practice is actually practicing performance and putting themselves in wicked environments and unknown environments and learning how to adapt to those and getting into that performance mind. So I think practice is a big deal for us as well, because if we are just in our preparation mind all the time, we don't actually work the performance mind muscle. And if we're just in the performance mind muscle all the time, we never actually get ourselves into a position where we can grow and develop and learn. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I like also uh, one of the shifts you have is analysis and instinct, because uh, I mean, those are, I, I think you get a balance of that. That's fantastic, because I think sometimes we, some people overestimate their instincts, but a lot of people underestimate their instincts too. Yeah, we live in an analytics world now and there's so much data and everyone's using data to get ahead and I've got this data and that data and it's great. And once again, just like the internet and we talked about earlier, the ability to learn has never been better. All right, well, analysis, do that detailed examination of the elements, learn, really get into um, how you interpret something, discuss it, analyze it break it down as much as possible. And when it's time to perform and you're in front of a client, rely on what your gut says, rely on that inclination or the tendency, because sometimes the data won't show you a decision that needs to be made for that circumstance, that situation, that environment. And that's where instinct can be massively helpful and the gut can be useful. So I think of analysis as really head thinking and instinct as more gut thinking. So really we use the head in preparation and then we really use our body uh, and our instinct in performance. Yeah, and I think that's a, it's always encouraged people because, yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, I think, yeah, it's great that we have all this data and people talk about big data. I always say, actually, big data, it's really small data because it's the data that's that's really applicable to your situation that counts, not all the data you could get. But the other part is how many times have you seen, you know, analysis and data and it, it says this one thing and as you look at it, you can see that this is where it's pointing at, but something inside you is going, but it doesn't feel right. And I think that's when you have to trust your instincts. If, if you have good instincts, bad instincts then don't. <laughs> humans, humans created computers. And so, you know, we have this tendency that I know everyone wants to talk about AI, like mm -hmm. certainly changes the world and changes how we operate. And I'm not minimizing technology. I'm not anti-technology. Like I think it's amazing what technology can do. And there will always be things that humans can do instinctively yeah. that I just don't believe a computer will ever know how to leverage instinct. And mm -hmm. uh, intuition is really important. And a lot of the best ideas and best innovations have occurred from intuition. A computer probably won't be able to do that and neither will analysis and by the way that's not minimizing analysis it's massive for your preparation it's it's really important to go into the head and reflect and figure that out because i actually think the way instincts are born are from great analysis and preparation and it frees you up to then use your instinct and performance absolutely and and another one of fear and fearlessness because people sometimes think that those are mutually exclusive right you know you're either going to be fearless or you're going to be fearful but sometimes it's good to have a healthy amount of fear and then to know the right times to be fearless if i didn't know anything about what you were doing on this podcast and i was like i'm just gonna show up and i'm just gonna wing it and just f it like i'm gonna go for it I wouldn't be as ready to serve you and your audience. And so having a little anxiety before we fire up the mics um, is healthy for me and allows me once again, to dot all my I's, cross all my T's, to having some concern or apprehension of loss, which is really what fear is. Uh, and even fear of failure, people say, don't fear failure. I'm like, well, in preparation, you need to do everything you can not to lose. And then you need to shift over to fearlessness, which is being bold and brave and without concern for the outcome or the loss or the result. So right now, I'm not all that fearful as we're, as we're chatting. But beforehand, it's important for me to have a sense of fear so I can be prepared so that I can then earn the right to be fearless. And I want to just make sure that that's really clear. With all of these shifts, it's about earning the right to be this way and perform 
performance. So if you have some fear in preparation, you've earned the right to be fearless. If you humbly prepare, you've earned the right to tap into your arrogance. If you analyze in preparation, then you've earned the right to tap in your instinct. But I think if you don't use that in preparation, then you're, you're really uh, dealing with a house of cards and it can stumble as soon as you face some adversity. Yeah, no, um, I often use martial arts because I'm, I'm a big martial artist and I always use martial arts as, as analogies for these things. And it's like when you spar with people in martial arts, right? you know, you need to have done your preparation, you need to have learned, and you need to have a certain healthy fear when you start off because you need to say, okay, I need to be careful because if I'm, if I'm just totally fearless and whatever, I could get myself knocked out here like very easily. So I have to like examine how the other person fights and then when I'm ready, I execute on whatever plan I have and, and then show my fearlessness or whatever to overcome the other person. But it's always that yin and yang balance of, of both. Um, because if you're, if you're too fearful, you're going to just get dominated. If you're too reckless, you're probably going to leave yourself open and get knocked out. And there does come a time where you have to execute and you have to take a shot and you have to let go of the concern of messing yeah. up or making a mistake. Um, but in order to get to that point, you have to make mistakes. You have to learn the pain of, of losing and, and what that feels like. I think about fear and anxiety and look, this can go too far. You, people have generalized anxiety disorders. People have panic attacks. Like that stuff's not to be messed around with and it's serious stuff. And having a healthy dose of anxiety is what allows us to go to the doctor when we don't feel well. Men, you and I are both men, we're terrible at going to the doctor. And that's not good. Like we need to have a little fear of something could be wrong and then you can catch it and then you can address it. I think about drinking and driving. You know, when if you go into the bar or as you would call it the pub and have a drink, it's healthy for you to have some anxiety to say maybe I shouldn't drive. If you're just fearless, and that's not that's not a good thing. Walking across the street, like looking both ways, that's good. Uh, but then at some point, you just have to walk. You can't just keep going back and forth, keep going back and forth. And I even will take it you know, one step further. Look, we're in the middle of a pandemic right now. Mm -hmm. And you've got people that are afraid to come out of their house or their basement and are just super fearful. And then you have others that are walking around without masks and are doing whatever they want and are maybe too fearless. And so for me, I love the power of and uh, the book is essentially about these polarities as it relates yeah. to preparation and performance. But I think you can expand it into your life because too often we think that you have to be one way. And I believe you can hold two things at once. And typically you need to figure out when do I use X when do I use Y? And if you can hold that space for yourself, then you can go toward X or toward Y at the right time. And I think when is highly underrated. Uh, and when we need to use the different elements of ourself is essential to thriving and uh, the human experience, really. Yeah, no, I'm, I love the I love the I love the layout of your book. I love the dualities because, as I said, I do totally believe in it, and the and the yin and yang exists within all of us and that you have to and that you have to adopt uh, or either one at the right time it's never one or the other it's it's the it's the right time and so i love it uh, the book is the book is called um shift your mind nine mental shifts to thrive in preparation and performance and they and i just read them out because i just think it's good for people to hear them because i love them it's humble and arrogant work and play perfectionistic and adaptable analysis and instinct experimenting and trusting process, uncomfortable and comfortable, future and present, fear and fearlessness, and selfish and selfless. And let's just end maybe on the self, selfish and selfless, because I think this is, the, this is the one where most people probably would struggle with that duality, right? Because they would either say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a very selfless, I'm a giver, blah, blah, blah. Or you'd say, and that maybe John over there, well, he's all just about himself. He's a very selfish person. But you can't, ex you can't exist in this world or succeed without a level of selfishness. Um, and you can't excel without a level of selflessness. Well, that was beautifully said. I think that there, there it is. <laughs> uh, I, selfish gets a bad rap. 
And uh, I think one of the things I hope my book does is just make people think. Uh, I'm pretty contrarian by nature, and I try to look at things a little bit differently. And for me, this idea of servant leadership or, you know, you have to be selfless, uh, humans need to take care of themselves first. And then they can be in a place where they can be selfless, uh, do well, and then you can do good. Put your oxygen mask on first and then help others. Uh, fill your cup and give the overflows to everybody else. And I see it with moms who are just pouring into their kids and never taking care of themselves. I see it with sports coaches who are overweight and aren't getting enough sleep. I see it with myself. I've got two small kids. Um, and there was a time in the last couple of years where I came home from work and my wife looked at me and just said, Brian, how are you doing? Are you okay? I'm like, I'm exhausted. And she was like, yeah, you, you haven't been doing things for yourself. And so to me, if we're selfish in preparation and we take care of ourselves, then we're going to put ourselves in a great position to serve our people, to serve our clients, to serve our family, whoever it might be. And so I think it, it is essential to make sure that you're in good shape, that you're taking care of yourself. If you think about a performance or, uh, or a salesperson, when you prepare, think about everything you need to be at your best so that when you're out and you're working with a client, you can be in service to that client. And I think if you flip any of these shifts and you bring one to the preparation, one of the performance, it really can, can be disastrous. So as people are thinking about what you just said, just imagine if you were selfless in preparation and then selfish in performance and what that might look like. And oftentimes it's pretty disastrous. The last thing I'll say is I have about like 35 of these shifts. So we focused on nine for the book because I didn't want to overwhelm anybody and nobody wanted to read a book that was a thousand pages. And I certainly didn't want to write a book that was a thousand pages. And some of the concepts were redundant. So we really focused and spent a whole lot of humble preparation and analysis drilling down on these shifts to get it to nine. But I also want to say that these are not the nine. There may be shifts or there may be words that you just said that someone would be like, no, I cannot be that way when I'm performing or I cannot be that way when I'm preparing. Totally cool. This is not like some one size fits all hack that you read this book and now you're good. Um, it's for you to think and think about your preparation mind and your performance mind. And I can't wait to hear from people that, that create their own shifts and tell me, Brian, this is what I'm doing. And I encourage people to do that. I think it's, it's a, important. And as I said, I'm just hopeful that maybe this conversation uh, gets you thinking about your preparation mind and your performance mind and, and how you can shift between each. Yeah, listen, that's that's beautiful, Brian, and uh, and I really I'm I'm so um, grateful of you coming today and sharing this with us because I think it's incredibly important. And here's the one last thing I will say is that one thing about the pandemic, as awful as it is, this is probably the best opportunity you are going to get to take a little time out to do some self development because maybe you're at home, maybe you're not commuting, all of that, and yeah, maybe there's other distractions, but take this opportunity because the world's going to get hectic again and when the world gets hectic you know we push these kind of things to the side and i think that's an unfortunate thing so i would really encourage you check out brian's book and do a little self-development invest in yourself because as i said earlier there's only one person who really really cares about what happens to you and that is yourself that's beautiful. That's, I, you, you said invest. And when I heard invest, I think that where most people go is money, but I would yeah, even I'd, just go, I would go time. Right. And I think yeah. to your point, like people have some space to go do something. Maybe they're not traveling for their job as much. Um, you know, maybe they're not going to sporting events. Maybe they're not going to concerts. Those things might be a bummer. Don't get me wrong. And there is space now potentially for some people to invest time in themselves. And I think that it can be money. It can be financially totally cool, but just, you know, it might be reading a book. It might be listening to this podcast, the time, you know, to your point, we often don't get the space to do what we want in a way like some of us are able to during this time. So I appreciate that. And, and I really believe deeply in investing in ourselves. I hired a writing coach for this book. Um, I thought it was important that I get coached and get yeah. help uh, to make the book as strong as it possibly can be. Uh, I've gone to therapy. I've hired coaches. Like I believe in investing financially, but there's also plenty of time, whether it could be meditation, it could be reading, it could be listening to a podcast. So uh, I love what you said. And 
and you know, I'm, I'm all aboard. <laughs> and I would just say to people, yeah, you're not going to concerts, you're not going to ball games or anything right now. And investing in this book is like, you know, that's like one beer at one of those events. So come on. <laughs> all right my name is john golden sales pop online sales magazine pipeliner crm i'll see you all for another expert interview really soon thanks again brian <laughs>